deviance, um, criminal justice is a whole huge aspect of sociology and, you know, a major in and of itself in academia, but we're going to focus in on just a couple of things today. If we were together in class, um, actually what I would have you do is what I call a deviant scale. And so I'd give you a piece of paper that's horizontal, that has a line across it. And what I would ask you to do is decide what are tiny acts of deviance? What are like a little bit more significant acts of deviance? What are pretty deviant acts? Um, and then continue on to really honestly what the worst deviant acts are. And this is a terrible activity that I technically hate because quite honestly, when you get to the one edge of the page where you're discussing what are the most deviant acts somebody can commit and you're talking about genocide and rape and murder. I mean, oh my goodness gracious, I am not the type of person that, um, you know, I don't watch shows that are violent. It's just what I can. I'm, I'm a wuss. Really, that's what it comes down to. I am just a big wuss and I can't handle suspense. I can't handle violence and anything like that. And so even just to have what is an important conversation about these atrocities, um, I just, oh my goodness, it's, it's not something I do very well. But it's always fascinating to me to see students discuss, like, and, you know, debate what is more and more deviant. A lot of times the underlying theme is how much somebody somebody else gets hurt, right? And so when you think of various abuses, when you think of possibly stealing or hurting property, you know, the more egregious it is, the more deviant it is. Um, other things that have stood out, I mean, granted too, you have to remember, you have to decide like, what are the smallest little deviant things that people could do? You know, something like burping, right? Would be technically it's deviant, but um, it's inconsequential. Um, Things that have stood out as I've done this for a handful of years with my uh, classes is, um, first of all, this, this one actually kind of ticks me off. Um, students will put like cheating on schoolwork or cheating on a test like way before, oh my goodness, I don't know, they'd say like, I don't know, rolling through a stop sign is, um, although, I mean, I said rolling, like, you know, not coming to a complete stop, not blowing through a stop sign, because those are two different kinds of deviance, right? But like, for instance, to me, students constantly put cheating, like way less deviant than I would have put it on the scale. So that's kind of unnerving to me. Um, that, you know, and kind of, you got to think too, like, for instance, um, you know, drug use, recreational drug use or otherwise, that has changed over the years. And so like where students will put underage drinking versus um, smoking pot or something along those lines, it's, it's just really interesting to think about. And so keep in mind what might have been deviant 10 years ago might not be considered as deviant today or even 100 years ago. So it's very much a sociological imagination, like the intersection of history and biography. The other thing, too, that I want to talk about, and I'm going to change sides, is the fact that the technically the definition of deviance is that it's any violation of norms. So let's bring that to right now because I'm recording this um, every week for you as opposed to I have recorded lectures from my previous online classes that I utilized. But um, for all of you, since we've had to change class in this virtual learning format and everything else, it's really important to me to be recording this specifically like in the time that we're at. And so what's the time that we're at as far as any violation of norms, right? Social distancing, that was a word that didn't exist or term that didn't exist two months ago. Um, Stay-at-home orders, right? Now it's deviant to, I mean, certainly, thankfully, thankfully, we're still allowed to go outside of our homes. We're allowed to go you know, for a walk and things like that, as long as we stay socially distant from others. And so it's been very interesting because Sean and I, my husband and I, we, we walk, like that's the thing we always do. We've walked pretty much every single day, like after dinner, before dinner, depending on the time of year and things for, I mean, years and years. Well, now we're constantly, because we will go out for a walk, but we're constantly going out into the street to get six away, feet away from people that might be in their front yard. And we're not just doing this out of, you know, concern for our safety, but concern for everybody's safety. Because who's to say that we might not be, you know, in a position where we might infect people. So to just really be, you know, considerate as far as a new norm um, and to be respectful and careful as a new norm. That wasn't, that didn't exist, you know, a month ago, two months ago. 
And so it'll be really interesting to see um, when you think about it. Is this going to be an outlier in our lives where it's like, oh, remember that time we had to do this? Or are some of these things that are new behaviors, these new norms that quite honestly, there's an element of deviance if you don't comply? Are they going to be new norms in our society that will literally be looking back on days previous to now going, oh, remember when we, you know, we could stand in line, you know, right behind someone as opposed to the fact that lines had to be always six feet apart or something along those lines. So by virtue of the fact that you define things as not okay to do, that they're deviant, that actually makes society stronger. So it kind of works backwards when you think about it. By saying, you know, you can't do this, um, we actually are kind of strengthening those bonds of, you know, again, being careful, respectful, and things along those lines. There are many theories. There's Merton strain theory. There's many theories I could share with you right now. But really, honestly, the one I always focus in on, and I just, for simplicity's sake, and this has been always that I just share one because I honestly think right along there with structure and agency and privilege, I think that this is one of the moments that really, really can be impactful in sociological learning is Hirsky's control theory. And yeah, apparently it's pronounced Hirsky. I know it doesn't totally look like that. So here's what it is. Deviant acts occur, as you can see, when one's bonds to society are weak or broken. Now, we've lived in a society for the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years, where acts of violence are more prevalent, right? Um, shootings at schools and work and thing. And again, this is not something I, I do well talking about because um, I just feel it to the depths of my soul is like just how terrifying this world can be at times. But when acts of violence occur, when deviant acts occur such as that, a lot of times I want you to think about when you hear like news coverage, you hear about that person being described as, you know, quite honestly, evil. Like the word evil is oftentimes used. And and certainly people make horrifying like life-changing, just the worst decisions human beings could make. Absolutely. But go back to what's on the screen in front of you. Deviant acts result when one's bonds to society are weak or broken. Somebody, and you've maybe heard this before, that kind of idea like hurt people, hurt people, right? Somebody who turns to those kinds of acts is struggling immensely. And we don't necessarily think about that. We villainize that. And it's tricky. It's a tricky balance because oftentimes after, especially like acts of school violence have taken place, there's kind of discussions after the fact that, you know, kids really should be, like fellow students should be reaching out to students who are being alienated and things like that. And I don't know necessarily if the onus falls to, you know, school children to like solve larger societal issues of alienation and everything else. Because remember, we talked about this with norms, positive sanctions and negative sanctions. And when someone doesn't fit into norms, oftentimes they get negatively sanctioned. And what does that negative sanction oftentimes look like? It oftentimes looks like people kind of ignoring you and not really having a connection to you. And so let me go through that the fact that social bonding has these four dimensions. One is attachment. That's in relation to family and friends and things. One is commitment to um, like society's norms and the way that they work. One is involvement. And involvement means involvement in conventional activities. Um, again, the times we live in, Sean is here at home, of course, um, teaching remotely his students. But if he were at school, it's track season. Sean coaches year-round, so flag football, boys basketball, girls basketball, and then track. And he loves them all, absolutely loves them all. And it's a two-hour-a-day uh, two after-school program that any student can join, and then they pick like an all-stars team towards the end of the season, and that all-stars team gets to go to a few different schools and compete. But it's very, very open as an after-school program. And the purpose is to give students at – uh, in his school district, it's more than just his school, a conventional activity to go to after school. Because there's been lots of research that when kids have time in between getting out of school and possibly families, parents getting home from work, that sometimes that unstructured time 
can end up being a time where students maybe don't make the best decisions as far as behaviors. And so this is a way to try and get involvement in conventional activities. Many of you were involved in possibly elementary school, but also mostly high school a lot of times with those kind of extracurricular activities. And so that's what we're talking about with involvement. And then beliefs, that you believe in society and believe in other people, believe in humanity. I really think if we started to conceptualize deviant acts in this way, because how many people near know about Hersky's control theory, right? How many people can really think about the fact that deviant acts result to one's bonds being, you know, weak or broken in society? When you when you learn it, it, it makes sense. Yes, again, like somebody who has suffered so much and hasn't had care, concern, love, and investment by, you know, family or educators and things along those lines, that they could struggle a heck of a lot more. And you hear this. You hear this when there's news coverage after an act of violence. You hear that this person a lot of times really kept to themselves or very, you know, they get described as a loner and, you know, problematic terms like that. And so to really think through, like, what is it that we can do together as a society? What is it we can do on a micro level to really be cognizant of this and what social changes could we possibly make? Okay, one last thing. For our discussion board this week, we're going to be taking a look at the marshmallow theory. Um, Some of you have, oh yeah, I know what that is. And some of you are like, wait, what is that? So I've included just this really brief two-page little article that gives you an idea of it. And then there's actually, I think it's a new story from San Diego from a while ago that's actually pretty cute, um, seeing kids try and struggle to hold on um, about not eating the marshmallow. And so together in the discussion board, um, we're going to share and kind of admit and fess up, which I think is really, really timely to how it is that, you know, we eat the proverbial marshmallow, what it is that we do because that idea of delayed gratification, when we behave and we get our work done first, right? When we do what we need to do, when we are responsible, that's what we're talking about with the marshmallow theory. And so I'll share a couple of examples of when I was responsible. You'll see that in the discussion board. It's actually old examples from one time when I was teaching, um, the uh, intro to social class that I have online for Santiago Canyon. I kept those same examples, but I kind of, you know, updated it with just a little blurb to today. But I struggle with this as much as anyone, making sure that we stay on task, making sure that my work gets done. It always gets done. I know yours gets done too. But really thinking about being reflective about those moments where we procrastinate and we don't do what we need to do. I think that because a lot of times, you know, deviance kind of occurs in that way. That doesn't mean that you go out and do some super egregious deviant act. But this is an element of deviance that I think is really purposeful for us to all have a moment of reflection on. And so I will be eager to see um, kind of both how we can all collaborate on our struggles, but also please remember in this uh, discussion board, we're also going to kind of pat ourselves on the back and say, you know what, here's something that I do a pretty decent job with. 